My name is Professor Michael Polkey. I'm delighted to introduce this short film about the sleep service at One World Beck Lung Health. I'm a consultant here. I'm also a consultant in the NHS, uh, and I hope you'll find the video helpful. What are the common causes of sleep disturbance? Well, it, it is fair to say that very often sleep disturbance is, uh, if you like, behavioural in nature, so insomnia, and sometimes that's appropriate. So we know that if we, for example, have lost a loved one, that we're maybe not going to sleep so well uh, for, for several weeks or, or months. Um, sometimes it's just part of life. So if you live next door to noisy neighbours or if you have small children, you're quite likely to be woken up at night. But there are also some specific sleep disorders. Um, in adults, the two commonest sleep disorders are obstructive sleep apnea and also a condition called periodic limb movement disorder. Uh, and both of those we can identify and treat here at One Wellbeck Lung Health. The pathway for investigating sleep disturbance is sort of straightforward. We tend to recommend that you first have a consultation with a sleep specialist. Uh, the purpose of that, of course, is to understand your symptoms better, uh, both to try to get a clue as to the cause, but also to understand their severity. Uh, but it, but it, we do also accept uh, open access referrals here at One World Back Lung Health from uh, general practitioners and other specialists who are not sleep specialists. Uh, but either way, at some point, if, if there's an issue, you're going to need to meet with a sleep specialist so that he or she can evaluate your symptoms. Uh, at some point in the journey, either before or after you see the specialist, a sleep study is likely to be necessary if we want to understand what is the cause of sleep disturbance because it's really difficult to get further forward without some data. Um, the sleep studies that we do at One World Beck Lung Health use a home sleep study equipment, so you will sleep in your own bed, but you would come up here one day to pick up the equipment and then bring it back to us the following day and then we download the data and uh, myself or one of my colleagues will analyse the data uh, and prepare a report and that can form the basis of a consultation to decide about treatment after that. So all of the equipment that we're going to use fits into this little box here so you, it's going to be no problem carrying it on the tube or ho however else you're getting to the centre and in the morning just stick it straight back in, doesn't matter any, any old how, however you want to do it and that allows us to get the data out from it uh, by our physiologists in the morning. Okay so here I just want to walk you through what will actually happen if you have a sleep study and the first thing I want you to note is that we're not wired up to the wall at all so if we want to get up and go to the loo or anything we can do that but these are the sensors that we've got so down here we've got an electrode that's attached to the leg here that uh, will detect any leg movement because leg movement itself can be a cause of sleep disturbance. But the real business end of it is up here. So we can see here we've got a flow sensor that will measure the air going in and out of the nose. Um, and that can be worn over the nose, which as you see here, or over the mouth if you feel that your mouth breather. Uh, and then the real business end here, we've got two bands, one around the upper part of the chest and one around the abdomen. The reason we have that is that when we're trying to make a diagnosis of sleep apnea, we uh, are looking for an absence of airflow, that's what the apnea is, but continued movement to the rib cage and abdomen. So those are the key data that allow us to get that. Uh, here we've got a body position sensor because snoring and sleep apnea are usually worse when people lie on their back. And if that's strongly the case, then we can sometimes think about a positional approach for that. And then the other thing that you'll see here is a finger probe that measures uh, blood oxygen levels during the night because we're obviously more interested in treating people who've got serious abnormalities of um, their oxygen during the night. Again, if the blood oxygen is very low at night, that's more serious than if it isn't. So here's the apparatus. You'll be, you won't put it on in the centre. You'll take it home with you and put it on yourself. We, we'll give you a guide to show you how to do it. Don't worry about what happens the following morning. All you've got to do is take the stuff off, stick it back in the bag in any old, any old how, and it comes back to us. And then uh, our guys will download the data so that we can analyze it and provide you with a result of that. It's impossible to, of course, give a comprehensive guide in a short video, but in terms of where the journey might take you, if we find obstructive sleep apnea, then the treatment will depend on the severity of the condition. Sometimes if it's very mild, we actually don't need to do any treatment and it's simply enough to reassure the patient and their partner. 
uh, that sleep apnea is mild. But if it is more severe, then there are a number of other options in play. The first thing, of course, is conservative management. Uh, and where the patient is overweight, we would advise them to lose weight. How, however, very often I find that, of course, the patient is aware of that already and has not been successful in doing so. Uh, the second line of treatment for milder cases of obstructive sleep apnea might include uh, positional therapy. We'd, we'd find that some patients are much worse uh, when they sleep on their back than on their side, and that's data that comes out of the sleep study. And where that is the case, there are a number of mechanical approaches that can be used to avoid sleeping on your back. And again, for some patients, that's sufficient to solve the problem. The second approach for people with milder disease is to use a dental device. Now, this is a little bit like a gum guard that a sportsman might wear, or if you have children, you might find your children are wearing it to play hockey or something like that. But essentially, Whereas a sportsman has the gum guard in a neutral position, uh, what you want for sleep apnea is to push the lower jaw forward like this. Um, and these devices uh, anchor onto the top jaw and push the lower jaw forward in that way. So you do, of course, have to have healthy teeth to do that. But again, that's a good solution for many patients um, and, and, of course, is very portable. Uh, the gold standard treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, though, is what we call CPAP. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And if you remember, we realised that the problem is about airway closure here. And what CPAP is, is a mask that's worn typically over the nose or sometimes the nose and mouth. And the mask is connected by a pipe, to a two metre pipe, to a unit that sits on the bedside table. Uh, and the, the unit on the bedside table uh, is actually simply a blower. People often think it contains oxygen, but it doesn't. It just blows air from the room down the pipe and through the mask. And the air pressure holds the airway open from the inside. So it's a kind of pneumatic splint, if you like. Now, uh, not everybody is wild about having to wear a mask at night. And uh, I think, don't think so many people would if it wasn't highly effective at relieving the sleepiness that's associated with sleep apnea. But uh, thousands and millions of people use this therapy worldwide because actually it does work. Now the common questions that come up with this are, will I be able to move around in bed without strangling myself? And the answer is yes you can, the, the pipe is long enough to do that and no one's ever strangled themselves. Um, and sometimes one's uh, partner or spouse is concerned about the noise of the machine, but the important point to note here is that the machine will uh, take away the snoring. So from the spouse's point of view, uh, this is a big advantage because the machine itself just makes a small hum a little bit like an air conditioning unit at most if it's correctly adjusted and is much quieter than the snoring that people with obstructive sleep apnea typically have. People often ask about surgery for snoring and sleep apnea and uh, I think it does have its place uh, but we have to be clear that uh, upper airway surgery is not really a treatment for sleep apnea although it can be useful for snoring and I think our recommendation as physicians would certainly be that anyone who's entertaining the idea of uh, upper airway surgery should have a sleep study first to make sure that they do indeed have simple snoring and not anything more sinister. Uh, from, from a surgical point of view, the other point that I often make to patients is that you know, weight loss surgery uh, is a very good option for, uh, for, for addressing sleep apnea because if you can successfully lose weight, you will certainly improve the severity of the sleep apnea, which may mean either that different treatment options become available or indeed that you don't need treatment at all. Uh, and of course it goes without saying that weight loss is good for one's general health. Sometimes people just have bad sleep without an underlying sleep disorder. In fact, that's very common. Um, there's innumerable uh, sources of, of self-help for this. Um, but what, 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 what I realise as a sleep professional is that, it, that sleep, what we call sleep hygiene is very important. Now, that doesn't mean washing, although we are in favour of washing. But what it means is uh, just be sensible about your sleep. So if you have difficulty sleeping, then for example, don't have any caffeinated products after midday. Now, uh, people often don't appreciate there's a lot of caffeine in things like Coca-Cola or Iron Brew. Um, 
your bedroom should be quiet and dark. We know that light emitting devices are a stimulus to stay awake, so if you are having trouble sleeping, we don't recommend using iPads before you go to bed. You know, use a paper book or a Kindle or something that doesn't emit light. Uh, as, a, as a general tip, the, the bedroom we think is for sleeping, so we, we don't encourage people to eat in bed, to do their work in bed, to watch television in bed, uh, and do lots of other things in bed. Uh, now, of course, if you can sleep fine while doing those things, that's absolutely fine, but if you are having difficulty sleeping, you need to, to, to do that. And then the final tip I would give people is that if you are having difficulty sleeping, you, you know, insomnia in effect, uh, don't stay in bed because if you do, then over a period of time you will form uh, poor psychological relationships with your bed. So if you're having difficulty sleeping, don't stay there and look at the ceiling. Please get out of bed, do something else, have something calming like some chamomile tea for example if you like that sort of thing. Um, and then once you've been out of bed, go back and have another try getting to sleep later on. Well, if you're concerned that you have a sleep disorder, uh, often the first port of call classically would be to go to your general practitioner. He or she will, of course, inquire what the problem is and may want to do one or two questionnaires of, of note the Epworth score, which is widely available. If you prefer, um, in terms of what we offer here, we do have uh, sleep specialists who would be very happy to consult with you uh, and to try to understand your symptoms better and if necessary arrange onward investigation. Um, in terms of referral, you, it's possible to refer yourself, but uh, be aware that different health insurers, uh, if you have health insurance, uh, have different views about sleep, so they don't all cover sleep, and many of them will want you to get a GP referral first rather than referring yourself. People often confuse poor sleep and sleep related disorders with just the passage of time and being part of life and, and indeed sometimes that is the case but it, it doesn't have to be so what I would say is if you do think you have a sleep problem then please talk to someone about it it's not it's not something that you have to suffer in silence with uh, similarly I'd just like to make a little bit of a plea about snoring um, I think there's a tendency in the, in these times when the health services are a bit stretched to think that snoring is either normal, which it's not, it, it's certainly common, but I wouldn't say it's normal, uh, or something that you just have to live with. Uh, but again, there, there are things that can be done about it, so I, I think if it is causing domestic distress, then it's worth speaking to somebody about it. Mm -hmm.